And to follow along on the back, uh, the only thing is my circle didn't come around the wife and Christ in the bottom, so you got to draw a big circle around them too. So that'll be important. Follow along on your handy dandy biblical guide to Eric's messages. Right? It helps make sense of everything. Father God, I'm so grateful that we could all be here today, Father. I ask that you would just speak through me. Holy Spirit, we just completely set aside all the things going on in our lives right now and all the noise of life. And Father, I'm praying that revelation will go into each and one of our hearts and minds as we begin to dig further into our value, identity, and our purpose and all these issues we have as human beings, Father. I pray that... Uh, our minds would be clear, there'd be no condemnation, anything of that nature, and we would just receive from the well of life today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to continue onwards. I'm going to, uh, at the end, I'll show you what I'm kind of going to plan out the next three or four weeks to finish this up. Um, we'll have it in a crescendo about our, our identity in Christ, ultimately. It's going to be really good. But I think after we get through this, you're going to have a really good foundation on some of the basics of things that you struggle and that you you know other people struggle so that you're able to minister to other people. And this will all be on our YouTube channel, so I encourage you to go back and study it. I know Dina said she watched it about two or three times and uh, she's really ready to go. So, part one today. We're gonna do part two next week because it's a lot of ground to cover and I don't wanna overwhelm so uh, we'll just take our time with it, if that's okay? Oh, everyone good with that? Okay, cool. How problems develop? Identifying the root is the key. Without a clear understanding of how problems develop, it is difficult to really address the root problems of our behavior and thinking. If you go over this with the lawnmower, what happens in a week? Right? So what, what happens a lot of time in our churches and, and things that we do is we put a lawnmower through everything, right? We think, oh, just behave better. Just obey the Bible a little bit, right? Just do that and you'll be fine. And all we're doing is we're lawnmowering. But until you go down with the weed killer, you don't deal with the problem because the problem's coming from where? The root. The root. Any farmers in here? Gardeners? Farmer's daughter. Farmer's daughter, yeah. I married the farmer's daughter. <laughs> Never did get to go in the hayloft, though. <laughs> Identifying needs. Some of y'all got that. Identifying, it's okay, every, every, you know? Love is love, the birds and the bees, right? Identifying needs. Because a person is a both physical and personal being, they, they have both personal and physical needs, right? We've been talking about this as just reinforcing. Our physical needs are obvious. Whatever is needed to keep the body alive, what do we need primarily? Food, water, water shelter, and in Florida, what is one particular you need? Air, Air conditioning. Air conditioning. Sunblock. <laughs> and sunblock. <laughs> Personal needs, the basis of our self-worth in the form of what have we been studying? Significance, which is what? Another word for significance? Purpose and security, another word? Love. love. There you go. Who's, who's the lover in here? You're bad. We must have purpose and love to remain alive as persons. Amen? And we also have number three is secondary needs. These are or another word for it is acquired needs. And I'm going to give an illustration to help you understand this. These are things we use or allow us to acquire or meet our primary needs. Many of these are what we call learned behaviors, right? Money, power, approval, etc. These are secondary, need, bleh, secondary needs. Here's an example. Money. This in of itself, what can you do with a paper bill? Burn it. It's, it's, it's no good in and of itself. But we learn that you can use it to go to a store and you exchange it for goods, right? How do we all get our food? 
money. Money, yep. Without money, you can't get food. So we learn from a little kid on, we need money to get food. That's an acquired need, right? That's a learned behavior. Here's another one, another illustration. When we, when we cross the stoplight, what is the ultimate purpose of a spot of a stoplight? Safety. Safety. You want to meet your primary need of being safe, getting across the road, so we come up with a stoplight. So now we have a learned behavior. We know when it's green, we can go. When it's red, we don't. When it's yellow, you run real fast. <laughs> And we have the little button down here, we learn to press the button to change the light, right? These are all learned behaviors to meet our needs. Basic examples, everybody understand that? The problem is, is our desire or our wants. Here's where we start running into trouble. We have to differentiate the difference between needs and wants. Needs you have to have, right? Food, clothing, shelter, all that stuff. You have to have that to survive. No one can argue with that. Amen? Wants or desires we do not necessarily need to meet our primary needs. But we think we do. This is where we start getting mixed up. People can never stop needing significance and security. Understand that. There is no shame in wanting to be secure. There is no shame in wanting to have purpose. There is no shame in wanting to be loved. You are built naturally that way by your designer in order to receive that because he wants to be that to you. Amen? Amen. So you're always going to need that. You Don't try to psychologically get that out of your system or you turn into a robot. We're built that way. So understand, it's okay to be, want to be loved because you should want that. It's okay to look for your meaning and purpose because you have a meaning and purpose. Amen? Now, but what we can stop needing are certain routes that we take to satisfy our primary needs, all right? The problem is, is that uh, you can stop needing them on certain routes to satisfy our primary needs if these routes create problems, we're going to look into this, and there's a problem-free route to meeting those same primary needs, all right? Here's the thing. You cannot function effectively for Christ without first having all of our primary needs met. Amen. We're born without our needs met. Maybe our mama feeds us and changes our diapers, but we grow up needing love and meaning. Mama can't be all that to you. She can be part of it, a piece of the puzzle. But ultimately, where is it found in? Christ, Christ right? If, if, as a believer, you're, you're not uh, secure in your identity, in your purpose, in your value, and your needs aren't truly met, you cannot function effectively for Christ. If you're worried or in anxiety or fear or all this stuff, that's interfering with your purpose, amen? And it causes bondage. Here's some examples. Think about this now. As we all go through this, we think that these are roots to meet our needs. They are not. Approval, money, fame, power, recognition, promotion, a new home, a good marriage. In other words, you say, if only I had a good marriage, I'm going to really have a good life. If only I had a million dollars, I'm going to have a really good life, right? Yeah. If only I was good looking, yeah. I'd be popular, right? right? If I had a better personality, I'd have more friends. These are the things we tell ourselves. A slimmer figure, business success, a nice car, kids that turn out well. Good desire, right? Yeah. Yeah. But is that the end of all things? Yeah. No. <clears throat> a lot of us get stuck in this one, that have kids. And friends, that's another one. My friends define my life. They influence your life, but your life is not in your friends. Amen? Here's another one. We want an effective ministry. That's a good goal, right? That's a good desire, but it does not meet your primary needs. Amen. You can have the greatest ministry in the world, and if you're suffering from a lack somewhere, it means nothing. Christ said you could do all these things and miss the whole boat, right? Number two, identifying our motivations. 
A motivation is the drive or urge to meet my needs. Very simple, right? Every behavior is motivated by something. Every. Amen? What I must do to become significant or secure. So your motivation, whether you realize it consciously or not, you're trying to meet a need deep inside of you, and it motivates you, right? People spend tremendous energy to satisfy these needs. Tremendous. How many of us have been there? Before Christ, you do all kinds of crazy things, don't you? Even sometimes in Christ, we're still going back to it, aren't we? So, we'll start out my little equation. First one, we start here. The basis of your life, you have primary needs, significance and security, and then you move, you start moving in a direction. Your motivation is the next step that takes you from there, right? The direction which I am motivated to follow in an effort to meet my needs depends neither on the needs nor on the motivational energy, but rather on what I think will meet those needs. Get that? In other words, I am motivated by whatever I believe will give me significance and security. Everyone get that? Yeah. that what, that's what drives everything that you do. And you don't realize it subconsciously you're doing this all the time. It's, it's just the way we're built. <clears throat> it starts in childhood. This is where it goes awry. We formulate many of our motivations and how to meet primary needs from our learned behavior as children. This is where you have to sometimes look back to the past if you're struggling in an area because you need to get healing there and then you move forward, right? If you're an insecure person, I'll bet $100,000 something happened in your childhood that, that started you on that path. Amen? <clears throat> We learn it from our families. We both consciously and subconsciously formulate our behaviors based on our experience of learning to fill our primary needs in our parents' image. Children watch and learn from their parents. They don't so much watch what you say, they watch what you do. That is the bottom line of what they're learning. So my wife and I we always have to worry because you see things in our kids and a lot of it's our fault. Not to bring condemnation, but it's the truth. It is what it is. You've got to deal with it. So this is why childhood trauma, especially at various key developmental stages, causes dysfunctional behaviors and habits such as abuse, anger, self-hatred, homosexuality, substance abuse, criminal behaviors, and a mire of other neurotic patterns and behaviors. Uh, Dr. James Dobson had a, some of the most powerful studies in bringing up boys on a chapter called The Root of Homosexuality. And basically what happens is at key developmental stages, trauma happens in the develop, developing stage of the person, whether boy or girl, and it flips their sexuality because then they're looking for their identity in what they're missing. So for a boy, and every, I have ministered to homosexuals, I've known them, every single one of them has huge issues with their father. Either they have abandonment issues, 100%, everyone I've ever met. Or they were molested, or all these things. And it, what it does, it kind of flips their uh, positive and negative, so to speak. And so, you know, what, what they're looking for is, I want to have a healthy relationship with my father, and I want to learn what it is to be a man. So subconsciously, they're looking towards a man as the problem, and when they're, and their, their, sexual, their sexuality is developing, they then take on the identity, and they latch their sexuality on a man. And it just warps it. And I don't condemn them for it. It's a trauma that happened to them that we all need healing of things. I'm just using that as an example. All these other ones. You know, children that grow up in abusive homes are either they're probably going to become abusers. It's not a generational curse, it's a learned behavior. That is what they learn how to meet their needs. Everyone get that? Come on up, Josh. I'm going to borrow this. Get too close to that speaker. That's the coffee hour to see if you're awake. All right, we got... We got another couple of fun stories. How many liked the stories last time? 
There it is. So just a really good way to kind of see some of this stuff. Go ahead. Jake grew up in, under an immense shadow of his, father, of his dad. Jake's dad held multiple records at his high school to this day for most receiving yards as a wide receiver on the football team and most wins as a wrestler. His dad went on to become one of the best wrestlers at a local Division I college. Jake was surrounded by his dad's accomplishments. As a young boy, Jake desired, desired to paint and showed signs of the gifted artist. However, his dad frowned on this and would, and would force Jake to be active in sports as long as he could remember. Jake was desperate to get approval from his dad since his dad on, pushed only sports. Jake realized he gained approval at athletic achievements. Meanwhile, Jake longed to be an artist but instead buried it and focused on becoming the next great wrestler. Jake went on to set records like his father. However, in college, Jake was losing his desire for sports and had a nervous breakdown as he could, as he could no longer deny his desire to be an artist. He was trapped living a double life of wanting to paint yet not wanting to lose acceptance of points. Thank you. Thank you. This happens a thousand times across the United States. Probably ten thousands of ten thousands of times, right? A father wants his child to relive his life for him. Yep. That is a very destructive thing to put on your son. I'm just using an example. Yep, you have to really be careful not to project your failures or your things that you missed in your life on your kids. You may be a wrestler, but your kid may be a painter. Let him be a painter. You will destroy your relationship with your son. And I've seen it happen dozens of times. Amen? All right. Desperate housewives time. I always like to take one from each sex so you can see the different things that the sexes go through. always grumble on how she worked like a slave to cook and clean and no one helped her. Her mom constantly complained about everything. She would constantly badmouth her father. Dad would internalize it until he had an outburst of anger. The cycle was never ending. Cindy learned to subconsciously anticipate offense and hurt from men. She grew up and married as soon as, and soon these patterns manifested. As soon as she received something as negative from her husband, she would get offended. She would automatically interpret at least the least thing as rejection and would lash out like her mother. She would waver between emotional outbursts and emotional rigidness and coldness. Her marriage soon settled into an identical pattern as, as her parents. Seeing this repeated 10,000. Thank you, Jesus. 10,000 times over, right? We teach our children how to interact with their spouses. They learn it by watching us. So you have a mom who's constantly complaining, upset all the time, screaming, yelling, outburst of anger. What does the daughter learn? She learned to see life through, I am going to worry about being a, a, an offense coming to me. And so everything is filtered through that bad lens of they're out to get me. My husband's out to get me. Hmm. So you're never going to be able to be healthy in your relationship with a man when you're seeing men as a danger. Amen? Amen. Wrong assumptions of how to meet our needs. Okay? These are wrong assumptions as illustrated by the story. Jake the Jock, he believed the wrong set of assumptions that acceptance and significance was found only through athletic accomplishment. That is what his father taught him. Whether his dad verbalized it or not, it is what he showed by his life. Jake got the lesson. Kids get the lesson. When you're, ver when you're acting the stuff out, they don't necessarily hear what you say, but what you're doing is what they're receiving. Amen? We receive more language of action than we do words. Speak stronger. Amen? So in addition, his desire was that he wanted to be an artist. So he was torn between the two as a source of his significance, and his double life led him to have a nervous breakdown. He couldn't take the pressure anymore, and that's what happens to us, right? Desperate housewife Cindy was really easy. The root problem 
was she had a wrong set of assumptions about security she learned as a child. She wanted to be loved and accepted unconditionally. But instead, her mother taught her that you work, work, work to get acceptance, but you're never good enough. Wrong set of assumptions, right? Everyone get that? Powerful, isn't it? It'll open your eyes to start seeing this stuff. The solution? Proverbs 22.6. Train a child the way that mm. they should go. And I know a lot of you have grown children and stuff. It's never too late to, to go back. There's no condemnation in these things. because We've made a million mistakes ourselves that we work through. But overall, you, you see, and you could do this with your grandkids. Who has grandkids in here? Yep. You can, you can be this to your grandchild, okay? The way that they should go. God will, God will give you strategies and insights into your child's heart. Mm -hmm. He will allow you to see their natural talents and gifts. And what you should do as a parent, what God desires of you, is then minister and encourage them in those things. Right? If, uh, you know, like in the same situation, if Justin was an artist, he's not going to be maybe good at carpentry like his dad. Let's just pretend. So what his dad wants to do is back off on the carpentry and say, you know what, Justin, you're a good painter. What can we do to help you out and explore this side of you? Bingo! All of a sudden you have a mural on in, in the, uh, for, for the next Bible study painted all over, right? In the living room. Here's some important points. We are to create in our children the response to look to the Lord for satisfaction of their personal and physical needs. Number two, our kids learn to depend on what we are depending upon for our satisfaction in life. Church devotions, teaching, etc. will not counter the message we convey by our lives. That's right. You could do devotions with your kid and pray before they go to bed every night, but if you're doing these other things, it will negate that. Amen? Yep. Because kids are looking for real life, not your words. They will learn that their needs can be met if they reach the same goal for which their parents strive. In houses, I have seen, I've, I'm sure everybody, did you have life experiences? Uh, I, I've seen in families, especially, you know, some of my um, customers, out, a lot of them are out on the island. I have seen things where they, they start striving to be uber wealthy. And so they put it in their kids that the meaning of life is to become uber wealthy. And that's the sole goal of their life. And you'll never find true happiness in that, right? But the kids learn that acceptance only comes through gaining wealth. Yeah. Everyone understand? Money, whoop, my end didn't come in there. <coughs> Spell check didn't catch that one. <laughs> Prestige did not satisfy. Hard work for the sake of hard work is empty, right? It's good to have hard work. Conservatives, we like to preach that, right? Hard work, hard work, hard work. Guess what? Hard work for the sake of hard work, is a dead end. You can become a workaholic in this life. That's right. Right? You look at Japan for that. They work 70, 80 hour weeks and live miserable. And they have the highest suicide, suicide rate by double any other culture on the planet. They have what's called the suicide forest outside of Tokyo. Anyone ever see that? It's a forest at the base of Mount Fuji where people go by the dozens to commit suicide. And there's bones. All of, they have to go in there and clean out the bodies constantly. Go on YouTube and, and, uh, and YouTube it. Shocking. It's called uh, the Suicide Forest in Japan. They, and they, they find people, they've built... The authorities are going, they have signs all over, please get help, don't do it, because so many people are going in there. They'll find tents with people that have, people hanging from trees. I'm not talking one or two, they'll find in a week sometimes six, eight people hang themselves. Because there's no life in work only. Right? Admonishing our kids to straighten up is next to useless. Straighten up. Stop it. 
Without understanding that all our needs are fulfilled in Christ first, people will gravitate towards quick fixes and what feels good. How do you think sex, drugs, and rock and roll started getting taken off in the 60s? You know why? You know why? Hate to say this, I know I'm going to, can I step on some toes? The conservative message got a little too conservative to the point where it was controlling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the primary needs, love, disappeared from the house because it started becoming, you must work and have the good image of the Smith family and the white picket fence. And we found life in being American and not being in God. We wanted the American dream that defined us, a whole generation. The American dream is not the dream of God. Some of it comes out of it, but it's not the end goal. That's right. The end goal is the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen? Amen. There are no generational curses, but learned behaviors that teach our children unhealthy patterns to find and meet significance and security needs. Very simple. So all this complexity I talk about, just break it down very simple. We have basic needs we want to meet. Whenever a person is struggling with something, go right to the book. What are they trying to meet? And then you'll start to see the roots that they're taking to get there. Number five, the church needs to hold out the reality of true security and significance that is only found in Christ. We must commit to the absolutes of Scripture and hold uncompromisingly to their practice, while at the same time showing unconditional love. That is where Paul said with that trivia question I had, speaking the truth in love. Amen. Because we have the absolutes, yes, but the absolutes in themselves aren't life. They have to come with love. It has to be a marriage of the two. Jesus came preaching what? Jesus came grace and truth. They go together. They're, they're a glove on each hand and they work together, right? Grace, truth, they go together. Amen? Amen. Unless these people find rational, legitimate answers to their deepest needs, which only Christianity affords or offers, they will become machine-like puppets, mechanically conforming to society's expectations or plunge into the blackness of utter despair. They're going to look to religions, false religions. They're going to look to drugs. They're going to look to relationships. Let me tell you, one of the most dangerous things I see causes especially young people to fall no, well, everybody really. You know what it really is? The number one thing that pulls people out of relationship with God is a wrong relationship. The most dangerous area that you have to be careful in is choosing and finding a mate. That will make or break a lot of your life. Yes, it will. You marry the wrong person and there's going to be some scars on your life. It's just the way it is. Yep. And I don't mean to condemn anybody, but that's just the facts. It's a warning. We need to let God be in our choices and let God bring our uh, mates together. Amen? Amen. Thank God for uh, Brenda and Larry, right? That's a good example. You know what I love about Brenda? You know what I love about the Peabody's that touched my heart from the day I walked in here? One of the first things I noticed last year, it was like June or whatever, the first time I came in, is that at the end of the service as a family, they all hugged and prayed together. Yeah. I have never seen that in a church before. Yes, I do. That is a sign of a healthy family. That's a sign of a healthy family right there. They are, there's no question they're a bonded, healthy family. I appreciate that. Basic assumptions, the strategies for meeting our needs. I will be significant if I have money. I excel. I never make a mistake. I am a hard worker. My kids turn out well. I am recognized. I am included in important circles. Anybody ever get some of those? <laughs> I will be secure if I have a loving spouse. I am never criticized. Perfectionism. Everyone accepts me. No one frowns or hollers at me or in some way rejects me. <coughs> I admit, I've probably experienced all those things. Yep. 
Amen? Amen. We all have. So then we move on to a goal-oriented behavior. It's our basic assumptions motivate us towards a direction or a goal. Goal-oriented behavior can be intelligent, realistic, or sensible, or it can be the opposite. Coming out of, remember, deficit motivations? We're, we're at a negative place and we're trying to meet our needs from outside of Christ. The goal, therefore, may not be reached. The person will feel threatened as their needs are unmet. They will then become anxious or resentful. Hmm. So now let's follow my little chart I got going. We have our need, primary needs. We're motivated to meet those needs. We then have basic assumptions of how to meet those needs, and we set a goal, right? That's how our behavior patterns of every human being works. Whether you realize it consciously or subconsciously, you're going through those processes. Isn't it amazing how a narcissist has all these complex traps that they set up in their relationships without ever formulating the thought of what they actually are? They just naturally do it. The control, right? The gaslighting, the bad-mouthing other people, the manipulation comes naturally. They don't know they have a psychology degree to figure plan it out. It's natural fallen human behavior exhibits it, right? And a narcissist is the most extreme level of an unhealthy person or a sociopath. That's when their needs are, have been taken to a place where they're so out there that they become their own gods. And they're unable, they lose empathy for other people. Hmm. And they don't have the ability to function normally in human behaviors. And you know, you know the two biggest things that attracts narcissists? Two biggest areas. Politics and religion. You want to find a narcissist? I bet you I can travel around all the churches in Vero Beach and there will be some narcissistic pastors. Amen. Don't forget to stop at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I was going there next. But that's okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible at this point to get to the White House without having some sort of narcissistic tendencies. Because it, you cannot hold true to your beliefs and be a politician in this day and age. You have to compromise. You have to have a forked tongue. Hmm. I don't mean the bad mouth politicians, but the, the, the modern American politician, I don't trust a single one. Scary. Oh, yes. My life is not in politics. My life is not in who's the president. My life is in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Emperor Tiberius, who reigned the Emperor of Rome during Jesus' time, was a pedophile. He had a special palace built for him where he would have orgies and do absolutely sick things with naked young boys. What did Jesus ever do to address it? Continue. He said, pay your taxes. That's it. And he preached the kingdom, right? Pontius Pilate was a sadistic governor who used to enjoy torturing people. In fact, the, the truth of history is he got so sadistic that Rome pulled him out of Jerusalem. Because he was causing the havoc. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus go around and bad mouth Pontius Pilate? Nope. When Jesus was face to face him, he said, you better change Pontius Pilate. Did he do that? No. Nope. Gave truth and grace. How about King Herod? King Herod murdered John the Baptist because John the Baptist confronted him over marrying his half-sister. What did Jesus say to Herod? Not a peep when he was brought before him. But he preached the kingdom. Amen. And he went about his father's business. You see, if you let politicians and politics take over your life, there's nothing you can do about it. Vote your conscience. Be a part of the, your citizenship duties. But Obama came and is going to be gone. We're still here. How much time did we give in the past eight years worrying about Obama? How many posts did we dedicated hammering Obama on our Facebook pages? How much did we, how much did we talk about Jesus? How much did we share good news? I'm just challenging you right now. I mean, there's things we have to address, of course, but think about it long and hard. We're kids of the kingdom. We don't have a president. We have a king. Amen. And he's perfect. Amen. And he is just. Amen. And he is righteous and holy. Amen. He's right here. That's 
right. And he is right here. My knee's only going down to one man, and his name's Jesus Christ. Amen. I love the U.S. Constitution, but I have a better Constitution called the New Covenant. Amen. And my Declaration of Independence is grace. Amen. Because the big, bigger kingdom that had me in prison to the prison of sin and the law and religion, I got set free from. Yes. And now my, my king said, tells me to stand fast in my freedom. Do not let myself be put under a yoke of bondage. Not to taxes, but to law, sin, and religion. So right. pay your taxes, and God has all things set. Daniel shed Shack on Pentecost. Don't worry about Trump. Don't worry about the lunatic. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's crooked, Hillary. I got everybody buzzing. <laughs> it's crooked, Hillary. <laughs> yeah, but Trump's no angel either. No. I think Trump is uh, quite a bit narcissistic himself. So you've got a choice of two unhealthy people right now. It's not going to solve your problems. I promise you. two evils who you're going to vote for. And when you're choosing a lesser of two evils, you're choosing evil. That's right. Either way. How do you wrestle with that one? <laughs> so here's where you got to draw your little circles in. I put it down here. you got the unhealthy versus the unhealthy. Here's what it looks like. The wife is the center of her life here. Okay? She's got herself as the center. <coughs> The unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Okay? She wants her needs met. So she looks, she's got her husband outside of her circle and demands that he meets her needs. Dominique. This is selfish behavior. Absolutely. She doesn't care so much about his needs. Absolutely. She only wants to see her needs met. I love her. That's her. How many marriages are like? You could switch the man here, too, because he does it. Right? Now... Here's the, here's the Christ-centered model. Christ is the center of our lives. He feeds the husband and the wife their identity and significance. And the wife and the husband reflect that towards each other. Amen. That's exactly it. That's God's design of marriage right there. Yep. If you're outside of Christ, you're naturally going to have this to some level. Some worse, some less. But it will be there. I believe that God does not allow us to have perfect peace outside of Him. Absolutely. I don't believe that there's perfect healthiness outside of Him. And He designed it. He actually uses sin and things of that nature to drive us towards Him. He turns all things for good. Right? That's why Christ came. The lesson of the woman at the well. We talked about this before. You all know the story. Go back and read it. It's powerful. Talked about it when uh, Jesus, uh, the master minister, we talked about this about four weeks ago. Reliance on any nourishment outside of Christ Himself will never bring contentment. That's those that list I gave you of examples. These things, ifs, do all of those. It's never going to bring you your you're feeding off of those, but it doesn't bring true contentment. The cycle of drawing water from the well becomes perpetual wearisome labor, continually toiling for something that never satisfies. And that was prophetic because a Samaritan woman left her jar and went to preach the gospel <clears throat> after she had a revelation of grace. Material possessions and money hold no water which can nourish the soul with true significance and security. Powerful stuff. I'm reading a... a I'm, I may just order copies for everybody. Bertie Britt's new book on Jesus as the Tithe is about this issue. You cannot find life in the money system. Nope. The money system, the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root, not of some evil, all evil. All evil. Wow. Amen. Amen. Because the world revolves around money, right? We need money to survive. God can bless money to us and we can use it as a tool. But it, the love of it will kill you. Amen. So we go into what I call, bringing it all together, is the prison cycle. Okay, this is the cycle 
that the fallen human being is in everyone in the world. You need your personal needs met. You are motivated to get them met. You come up with basic assumptions of how to meet those needs. You then set goal that I will behave this way to meet my needs. You then live out of your goal. You get partial or temporary satisfaction, but over time it's not truly filled, so you have this sense of emptiness. So you say, I'll start all over again, right? And everybody's, this is called, notice where you're going? Around the mountain. Around the mountain. You're taking laps. And you're doing this over and over. And here's what happens. People get deeper and deeper and deeper. They can't take it. And experiment with trying other things that fill their needs. Alcohol, drugs, all this stuff, right? They'll then go to that level. Oh, I must do this to meet my need. This isn't working out. Robin Williams hung himself Why? The man had $45 million in the bank. George Eastman, the founder of Kodak, was the richest man in the world in, what was it, 1900, 19, early 1900s? Wrote a, a, a letter, put it on his desk, and put a pistol in his mouth. Richest man in the world. He was the Bill Gates of his time. And he said, there's nothing else for me to do. That's all he wrote, his suicide note. Vanity of vanity. Because the money didn't fill the void. And so eventually you go into what's called, is a fancy term, existential despair, or just basically it's nothing's working, I'm getting depressed, I'm be getting hopeless, right? And eventually it can lead to suicide. A person says, because I have no value, there's no value to be found in the, in the world, that I'm worthless and I am unlovable, I would rather be dead than to face that. It's very, but people, people say because naturally our instinct is survival, right? And we'll look at these people that commit suicide and you're thinking to yourself, how could you do that? But when you really reach the depths of despair, you'll do anything to stop the pain. That's what drugs and alcohol are trying to stop the pain of the reality. Because all this, these laps aren't working, right? And you're trapped. The way to freedom is Christ. Amen. Because when we start from Christ, and our personal needs are met in Him, and we live out of our union with Christ, guess what? We're motivated differently, aren't we? Yep. We have a different set of assumptions, right? We live from a place of grace. Right? Amen. Your assumption now as a believer is grace. Amen. Right? And your behavior comes out of the union of Christ living in you and through you. Amen. And your goal is not to for, live for yourself, but your goal becomes to glorify Christ. Amen. And the kingdom of God flows outward out of you into the world around you, and you have full satisfaction of life. You live in the abundance of God's life right here. And you're full. That's how, that's how you were designed. You were not designed to live like this. That's why it doesn't work. You were designed to live your life in Christ. Amen? Amen. Powerful stuff. Coming up. Part 4. There's a second section I want to go over on this. And then we're going to talk about Christ as our sufficiency. And then we're going to go into um, offenses and rejection. And finally, it'll end up with, uh, before we go on to the next thing, uh, test trials and temptations. We're going to take a biblical look at that over the next month. How does that sound? Amen. Everyone enjoy that? You get, you, you get some good teaching out of that? It's a real practical way to look at it. And, and I encourage you to go back and rewatch it and study your notes and just let God show you things. You're all competent ministers of the gospel, right? That's right. And you rely on the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We are going to go ahead and have our communion.